Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm your host, Lee Vinsel, an associate professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. You can reach me with comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or on Twitter at STS underscore news. I would love to hear from you. Welcome to episode 30, the final episode of season one of Peoples and Things. Producer, sound engineer, and good buddy Joe Fort and I will be taking the summer off to retool a bit, but we have a bunch of exciting things lined up for you later this summer. More podcasts with all kinds of great guests, maybe some YouTube videos, and other mysterious developments I will leave up to your imaginations. In many ways, this podcast has been about stories we tell about human life with things and why we should put more confidence in some stories than others. Stories about Silicon Valley have been central to how popular culture has talked about and envisioned technological change in the past several decades. I think as the air goes out of our current technology bubble, we are once again seeing that a wave of stories coming out of Silicon Valley have been little more than hot air. For example, stories about how Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, and other so-called sharing economy companies constituted a technological revolution. Well, frankly, that was a load of bull. These companies don't even know how to make a profit. What we need then in our lives are good stories, better stories, stories with truth in them. I think this episode, an interview with longtime technology journalist John Markoff, is exciting when it comes to good stories about technology and Silicon Valley for two reasons. First, Markoff has covered Silicon Valley since the early 1980s and reported on business and digital technology for the New York Times for 18 years. He has written on a wide variety of topics over those decades From the environmental damage of digital industries, to the lives of hackers, to nanotechnology, to the role of Bay Area counterculture in computing, to the ethics of robotics and artificial intelligence. In this interview, John and I first talk about his long career. He was a tech journalist long before that idea even existed. I wanted to hear how he became such a person. And second, I talk with him about his new book, Whole Earth. The Many Lives of Stuart Brand, which is also very much a story of Silicon Valley. We talk about Stuart Brand's life from being an LSD psychonaut to editor of the Whole Earth Catalog, from being a prophet of computing and the internet to a proponent of long-term thinking and maintenance. I also talk to Markov about what I and many others see as Brand's lack of politics, or what we might even call conservatism. In the end, Though I see many valuable things in his works, as I explained in the episode, I am deeply skeptical that Stuart Brand has the ideas we need to move our society forward, including when it comes to important issues like facing up to global climate change. I hope you find my conversation with John Markoff interesting. I had a lot of fun with him, and it was a real honor. Get excited. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's nice to be here. Good, good to talk to. So uh, I do want to talk about Whole Earth, but I, I kind of want to put in the context of your longer career. You were what we now call a tech journalist long before that idea ever existed. So how did you come to, to write about the businesses and technologies of Silicon Valley 40 years ago? So without going... Uh, on too long. Let's see. I grew up in Palo Alto, California, which ended up being uh, part of Silicon Valley. Um, 
I actually uh, played in the Hewlett um, family household. Bill Hewlett went to school with me. Bill Hewlett Jr. went to school with me all the way through uh, elementary school, junior high school, high school. Um, and I delivered newspapers to in Palo Alto, the future homes of both Larry Page and Steve Jobs, which is kind of richly ironic at this point because they probably did more to change the way news is delivered than any two humans on the face of the planet. Um, and then I, I, so I graduated from high school in 67. I went to the Northwest for college and graduate school, and I came back in 1977, and this thing called Silicon Valley had emerged. And I was, at that point, I was a, I was a political activist as a result of the anti-war movement, and I was very interested in uh, military technologies. That's sort of where I began mm -hmm. my career as a reporter. And I was, uh, so I was, you know, before it was a, a microelectronics center, um, uh, the region was an aerospace economy. Uh, Lockheed um, was the dominant uh, employer. And so I, w I began writing about uh, what I later came to call the dark side of technology, right. uh, the use of these technologies for a military economy. And then around 1981, um, the personal computer industry was emerging and it was just, Ronald Reagan was elected. It was more fun to write about, uh, you know, personal computing and microelectronics than it was. Bombs. And I got a job. Uh, yeah, bombs. Smart bombs. Smart bombs, right? right? Uh, I, I, I got a job uh, writing for the first weekly for the personal computer industry, which was called InfoWorld. And I, I sort of, I, you know, I was sucked into what John Doerr would later call the largest legal accumulation of wealth in history. Yeah. So I watched that. Uh, and, you know, you were, as you've described, you were a hometown boy and, you know, and yet this is happening around you. So, I mean, I, for the last 15 years now, there's been incredible excitement and kind of verve around Silicon Valley firms. In the early 80s, was there similarly kind of, you know, was there a, a, a lot of energy around these firms? Was it really exciting in the way that we think of it now? Yeah, there there were different generations, and I mean, I, I'm not sure which generation in the last 15 years are we're sort of crossing some boundaries. There was the dot com era, and now we're into the social yeah. media, and now AI. So you know, there, yeah, we moved through, but but I was around from the move from the integrated circuit to personal computing, and personal computing. You know, my general sort of sense of this is as as microelectronic technologies have evolved, each generation has reached a larger fraction of the population of the world. Um, one more turn of the crank and we're at, you know, everybody in the world has one of these devices. Um, but, you know, personal computing um, was the first time that, you know, we sort of created a consumer electronics industry. And this, this technology was no longer sort of in military and large corporate settings, but it moved out into the household. Yeah. And so, yes, I mean, um, you know, S Steve Jobs and Wozniak probably were the archetypes of that sort of interest and in, um, the personal computer. You know, InfoWorld was interesting because it, it originally imagined itself as a, sort of a rolling stone, you know, for a hobbyist yeah. culture. And then it quickly sort of moved into becoming a business publication as it tried to become a, a business week for, for a, a new set of business users who were using yeah. And so, I mean, you had done a little, you had done journalism a bit before you ended up at InfoWorld. Was it, was it a big transition moving from kind of like, you know, what the work you were doing to a very specialist magazine that was really focused on this one industry or was it pretty seamless for you? Well, that was pretty interesting because InfoWorld, the people who are running InfoWorld were not really professional journalists. <laughs> and so I walked in, I had, I was also coming out of you know, I hadn't gone to journalism school. I had spent five years working working for the alternative press, mm -hmm. and I was writing for something called Pacific News Service. And the funny thing about PNS is they were um, they were a news syndicate that was picked up by over three hundred papers around the country. And so I had great clips. I had clips from all the major newspapers when I walked into news uh, to Infoworld. They thought I knew what I was doing because they didn't know what they yeah. were doing, and so they hired me because they <laughs> thought I had professional experience. Uh, and we all sort of were making it up as we went along at that point. And it was fun. Uh, it was a, a, you know, a group of people who were sort of close to the hobbyist personal computing world. Um, it was vibrant. You know, home, homebrew was still meeting back then, yeah. the Homebrew Computer Club, which was where, you know, Apple came from, basically, and probably 20 other mm -hmm. companies. 
You know, the last few years have also featured, you know, very public and often kind of ear piercing criticisms of digital technology companies that some call the tech lash. But you are one of these few writers who have been pointing out the kind of darker sides of these industries for a long time. So in 1985, <laughs> you published the, the a co a book with a co-author called The High Cost of High Tech. So what was that book about and what was the high cost of high tech at that time? Yeah, so that's if, first of all, just to put things in context, uh, it, it was it yesterday, the day before yesterday. You know, there's now at at Stanford at the Green Library, the main library, they've reconverted, they've converted the floor into um, a set of exhibits mm -hmm. about Silicon Valley and technology, and then really, it's a it's a beautiful space that they've created. So I just got my tour of it yesterday with Henry Lowen, who's the archivist, and I was completely freaked out because that book is in a display <laughs> on the exhibit floor. And it's like I've been stuffed and put on the wall <laughs> with Lenny. Your uh, history so, now, John. You know, where I'm right. already part of, I've become a history, which was very disturbing, actually. But um, so Lenny and I, you know, that came out of, uh, it, once again, Lenny uh, was someone who'd gone to Stanford. You know, Lenny uh, recently was the mayor of, of a Silicon Valley uh, city of Mountain View. So that was ironic, too, because Lenny had started as an activist. He created, he was involved in an organization, a, re a small movement research group called the Pacific Center, a Pacific Study Center that I ended up uh, spending time at. And it really came out of that, um, the politics of the anti-war movement of the 60s and 70s, and which, which was, became very anti-corporate. Mm -hmm. And so we, we began looking at the corporations that were emerging in Silicon Valley and some of the labor and environmental yeah. issues that were emerging. Um, multinationals, uh, uh, you know, the, the global supply chain was just emerging. And so um, they were creating this workforce that was being exported into Southeast Asia. And there were all kinds of labor issues. And then, of course, at that point, they were still manufacturing at, at scale uh, in the region. And it was an environmental yeah. nightmare. And so we were pointing out those kinds of things. And then there were also issues around, <laughs> believe it or not, there was a point, I mean, this was a real lesson for me, where Lenny and I in, in the early 80s thought that Silicon Valley couldn't grow anymore because the, <laughs> the, the consequences of growth were re readily apparent. And, um, you know, we, were, we thought that Silicon Valley then, a decade old or whatever, had reached some, some sort of limits. I mean, at that point, you needed two incomes to live in Silicon Valley, and we thought that was remarkable. How could that go yeah. on? And, um, <laughs> so we were early to, to call... Um, you know, computer networks were not even really on the horizon at that yeah. point. That was sort of very early, but but the the, the you know the consequences of this technology were already raising mm -hmm. significant questions. I heard some anecdote, uh, pr maybe from someone at the Computer History Museum about um, you know uh, Silicon Valley being like one of the densest areas of Superfund sites in America or something like that. You know like that in uh, New Jersey. So it's a pretty polluted place from this, these earlier moments in its history, right? It, it was. Um, there were not restrictions. Um, I remember going to a, a trailer park uh, downwind from a semiconductor factory in Sunnyvale and a guy showing me he could wave a ketone stick, uh, this, you know, this, the sensor in the air and capture uh, stuff. It was floating. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was supposed to be a clean light industry, but in fact, the pollutants were invisible. And, you know, what happened, not for environmental reasons, well, it was partially for environmental reasons, but also for labor cost yeah. movements as they ex manufacturing was exported and became clean that yeah. way. And they moved the, ex they moved the pollution to Asia, yeah. basically. Sadly true. Um, in 1988, you moved from what you ended up at the San Francisco, San Francisco Examiner to the New York Times. And I just wondered, I mean, you've certainly covered a lot more than tech during your time there at the Times, but more and more that kind of became a central part of your work. So I was just wondering, what was it like kind of covering new industries, not for locals on the West Coast who are involved in the computer industry, but for the like, you know, this East Coast establishment that's like the nation's newspaper of record? What was that transition like for you? Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I, I was at that point working for the San Francisco Examiner, and I was. I was there because I was writing about Silicon Valley, and the Times brought me to New York to be what would they called then their national computer writer. <laughs> so there was one person in Silicon Valley who was not really. I mean, at that point there was still a banking industry in the Bay Area, and so he had 
a multi, you know, Andy Pollack was doing multiple uh, roles. He wasn't just covering technology. And I was in New York as the other techno, as the other computing mm -hmm. writer. Um, the Times had a broader view of technology at that point, And there were people writing about other kinds of technology. These days, yeah. you know, everything sort of devolved into the internet. But at that point, I was brought back as a national computing writer. And in 1988, from the point of view of the New York Times, that largely meant I was responsible for IBM. And then I could write about other things. Because IBM was seen as the dominant factor, and it was the dominant yeah. factor still. It was just just changing at that point, and um, you know it was striking for me as uh, as I mean I was not a, I was I was in my forties by that point, but going up to see IBM's manufacturing uh, processes and manufacturing lines uh, in the Hudson Valley where they made mainframe computers, and I was so struck because that I had a very different idea of how you made computers. Yeah. I mean, you know, IBM's big problem in making uh, mainframe computers was extracting heat from these, these very high-speed circuits. Mm. And so you had these basically, these plumbing systems that had to uh, use uh, water to move, uh, you know, heat away from the circuits. And that was not the way it worked in Silicon mm. Valley. Um, it was a very different thing. So I started... Um, I started uh, as a as writing about the mini computer industry, the mainframe industry, but I was still focused on Silicon Valley because I could tell that was the story. And I I was out on the West Coast a, a half a dozen times a year, mm -hmm. um, and after four years, the Times let me come back. <laughs> right on. That's what you wanted to do, huh? So, well, um, you know, I was never. I mean, just from I was I was I thought the story yeah. was there, the story I was interested in writing about, and um. You know, it, it, the Times was very, they let me go where I, what, it, with what I was interested about. And, you know, I was, I was writing about things. When I was at the Times in 88, one of the first stories I wrote that had a really big impact was uh, 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 what was called the Morris Worm. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really the first time, this is November of 88, it was really the first time that computer networks, for both all their positive and negative sort of effects they're going to have, were really reached a national mm -hmm. audience the, and, and that 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 was that kind of a thing. I was going to ask you about the two books on uh hackers that you published in 90s which I think I'm pretty sure I checked out from the public university or public library in Joliet <laughs> Illinois when I was in high school <laughs> and read them because I was very passionate <laughs> about that topic at the time so was that, you know how did you get was that covering that worm how you kind of got into that topic or yeah how did you get into hackers well, no, I had actually, I mean, I had been, I was one of a generation that was, that grew up on uh, cyberpunk mm -hmm. science fiction. So I was a science fiction uh, aficionado always going back to high school, but also I was early to see computer networks because I had friends at Xerox mm -hmm. Park where they developed the first computer networks and they developed programs that had the ability to move through networks. And then I got in the late 70s, uh, my, my experience with computer networks goes pretty far back because I got my first um, ARPANET account. And I was interested in, in being part of ARPANET because there, I wanted access to a, a mailing list, um, listserv called HumanNets, mm -hmm. where uh, technologists were di discussing the impact of the technology on society. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to contact people who were actually building the technologies. And it was really quite... You know, it was it was a back door for me. But at that point, um, this is the ARPANET preceded the Internet. Um, the ARPANET was this uh, military funded network that touched large corporations, and universities and military organizations. And I got access to uh, MIT AI, which was a machine in the East Coast by dialing my little modem into <laughs> a NASA tip, which was a modem pool that was not password protected. And then I could read that. But then that brought me in contact with this bulletin board culture, mm -hmm. this young, this is even, this is before war mm -hmm. games, which is really, you know, the term hacker started out as a positive term, uh, you know, to re referring to the subculture at MIT of people who were exploring this world of computers and networks. And then ultimately, um, you know, you got this generation of young boys, mostly who were bored, who were playing around in these networks. And it was before the we really re realized where this technology was going. I wrote the very first story on a, 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 a arrest for um, a, a sort of passing illegal information over bulletin boards um, in 19, 
it might have been 82 wow. at, at InfoWorld, where an interagency task force um, uh, broke into the home, uh, literally with a hammer, uh, a sledgehammer of a deck employee who had a bulletin board system running in his, in his apartment off of El Camino Real in Santa Clara and took away the computer um, called 8BBS because it was de dedicated to the free, free, share, free sharing of information, much of which would involve credit cards and other yeah. illegal things. Um, that was that was that that world. I, I saw that world early on, and it was completely a question of life imitating art because the science fiction writers were the first ones to do this by far. They predicted this dystopian world. Um, books like Neuromancer and Snow Crash, and most importantly, True Names by Werner Vinge, mm -hmm. really uh, predated the emergence of that culture. Yeah. Um, that oh, you know. Um, I ultimately walked away from covering um, computer security and cybercrime in, in 2011 after doing it for almost 30 years and gave the beat to Nicole Perlroth. And it turned into the best beat at the New York Times. She was on the front page for the next <laughs> decade, but it, be it became an affair of the nation right, state. Right. So, But at that point, I decided if I had to write an another story about a testosterone poisoned teenager with an <laughs> attitude, I was going to have an aneurysm. I just had to do... I'd written the same story too many times. I had to do something yeah. else. And, you know, I gave, gave her the beat. Well, that's funny, man. Um, in 2005, <laughs> you published What the Dormouse Said, How that 1960s Counterculture Shaped the Personal Computer Industry. And now there's like a giant literature on this topic. But I feel like, again, you were, you were on this topic um, pretty, pretty early, uh, all things considered. So, I mean, how'd you end up, how'd you come to write that book? And I mean, you've already kind of described you were a part of this kind of anti-war counterculture. I mean, this is part of your experience. Was it just like reflecting on where yeah. you'd come from and where the industry had come from? Yeah, it, it was in a sense. I mean, so I've always believed that uh, technologies are rooted in culture and society and that they, re they interact and reflect with yeah. them. And it was sort of trying to understand, you know, I was gone from uh, this part of the world from 67 to 77. And I came back and there was this amazing uh, economic and technological region that yeah. emerged that was like a Florence. It was, it was, re it was changing the world. And so in a sense, it was, I, I call it an anti-autobiography. It was what happened while I was gone <laughs> um, to my yeah. hometown. Uh, and I really wanted to understand. And, you know, Dormouse, I was trying to understand the interaction between technology and culture and politics. And, you know, uh, while the microprocessor was sort of making its way out of the laboratory, there was a, a vibrant counterculture, uh, a civil rights movement, and a, a, a really intense anti-war mm. movement right in a, a 10 mile you know, mm. region. And I wondered how those things interacted. And I think I came to, I mean, you know, I'm a failed sociologist. <laughs> I, I, right. I dropped out of a graduate program in sociology and I'm sort of, I, I, I try to understand how these things interact. And I, I actually think I came to the theory that explains this because you know, a lot of people basically said that I was sort of making the argument that uh, LSD leads uh -huh. to, uh, you know, creative inventions. Uh, and that's not the argument I was trying to make. But I did think there was some relationship between those two things. And some social scientists at the Santa Fe Institute um, have a theory about, uh, I think they describe it as creativity on the edge of chaos. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we saw in that situation um, on the peninsula, where there were three laboratories um, between 65 and 75, 62 and 75, that surrounded Stanford University, where all of the modern technologies were either invented or refined that became what we know as personal computers and networks today. So why did it happen there mm -hmm. and then? And... Um, you know, those laboratories were situated in the midst of this play, this world that's very unlike uh, the Silicon Valley of yeah. today. It was, the, the, you know, you just you can't understand how different it was. Um, there was so much going on. It was, it was a different time and a different, uh, uh, the, 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 the politics, the cultural politics were entirely different too. So I think that played a role. In, and, you know, there were so many things, um, and this is sort of, um, on, in Northern California, during the 1960s, uh, people were looking for ways to augment human intelligence in different yeah, ways, sure. um, from technology to drugs to religion yeah. to est. All of these things were swirling and interacting. Mm -hmm. 
uh, around expanding the human mind. And they played off of each other during that. So um, in 2015, you published Machines of Love and Grace, which is actually the first book I read of yours, um, which covers the history of robotics and AI and both the benefits and costs that, that could come from them and have come from them. But by, you know, by 2015 or 2016, um, you, you have this long career doing what you've done and as a kind of tech reporter, you start working on a book on Stuart Brand and start hanging out with him and interviewing him. I think you say you spent like 72 different interviews or something like that in the back of the book. So yeah. what, what led you to turn to Stuart Brand at this point in your career? So uh, I'd been at Times for 28 years uh, and I was... Uh, you know, I wasn't. I hadn't completely gotten daily journalism out of my my uh, system, but the Times really uh, was not interested in me doing something mm. else. They wanted me to keep covering AI, and I had written about AI pretty intensely for a decade, and I was ready to write about something else. And so, for whatever reason, I walked. I you know, almost seventy. I walked away from. Um, I walked away from daily journalism. Uh, and in part, it was because Kevin Kelly, who was a, a protege of Stuart Brands, he was the first editor of Wired, he's a friend of mine, um, called me up one day and said, hey, you know, Stuart was thinking about writing in his autobiography, but he's decided not to, but I think he's interesting enough that somebody should huh. write his biography, and I think it should be you. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, for a couple of reasons, um, I'm really, I, Stuart was the right person and the right vehicle for me. I mean, he... He was about a decade ahead of me. I followed a path that was sort of behind brand yeah. in, in many ways. Um, I, you know, we overlapped in lots of different ways. And so there was stuff around um, Silicon Valley that he was instrumental in, that I was interested in. The puzzle of why Silicon Valley happened, where it happened, when it yeah. happened was part of, you know, brand lived there twice um, it, it, while he was in college and then later. And, um, and then, you know, it just, he was an interesting character and I liked the idea of, of trying something long form and biography that had a narrative arc that I could just follow rather than having to create. Yeah, that, that makes so, sense. I, but, I know as I was thinking about your career the last couple of days, it, you know, it seems like an extension of lots of stuff you've covered. Computing is in there very much, you know, but also the Dormouse book and, uh, you know, uh, as we'll talk about, Brand was very <laughs> wrapped up in kind of psychedelic counterculture of that that time in california yeah. so it seems kind of like an extension of a lot of the themes you've discovered and or played with before yeah and he touched on both of, you know one of the reasons i wrote in machines of loving grace or one of the things that i brought out in machines of loving grace is this uh dialectic or paradox um between artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation which has you know which i noted first uh, in Dormouse, uh, there were these two labs in 1962 that started on either side of campus and one sent out to replace the human. That was John McCarthy who coined the term artificial intelligence. And the other set out to extend human mm. intelligence. That was Doug Engelbart who coined the term intelligence augmentation. So you had this dichotomy of AI versus IA. And Stewart ended up being right in the middle of yeah. that as well. And it's been a tension that is at the heart of modern computing ever yeah. since then. And so I was that, you know, that's brand brand was part yep. of that. So I think brand will always uh, be best known for the whole earth catalog. Um, and my parents were kind of back to the landers and then briefly in the 70s. And I actually have <laughs> this is my dad's copy of the night, the whole the next whole earth catalog access to tools catalog. And uh, I actually bring this yeah. to class to show students. Um, and, you know, sometimes I just go through I was going through it today and I was just like, I would love to know what kind of fantasies were going through my dad's head when he highlighted, for instance, the book titled Manual for Individual Water Supply. You know, that's highlighted in the book for some reason. It's like, what <laughs> What was my, like, 21-year-old dad, like, thinking about at that exact moment, you know? Oh, that's great. <laughs> but that's so, that's so perfect because that's, that is what Stuart had in mind when he started out to do this. He was thinking about a generation that was going back to the land and he realized they needed information and they needed tools. Yeah. And, and it was that path that he was trying to create. Where, where did your dad go back to the land? Uh, they hung out for a while in Durango, Colorado. They're both from Ohio, but okay. they were, yeah. you know, they worked at like, my dad worked at a summer camp there and had visions of l remaining there, but uh, eventually went 
back to East and got a job and stuff, you know, as it have, tends to happen. <laughs> Did you know about Drops? Drop City, the, 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 the famous commune in Colorado is called Drop City. I'm not sure. I'll have to ask him about that. I, I like asking him about yeah, those days, his, you know. <laughs> his fantasies yeah. of became like some kind They're... of leather making uh, <laughs> something. I don't know, you know. <laughs> that was very much in the air at that time. And Stuart tapped into that and helped in a way spark it. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's exactly. I mean, that, I love the fact that your dad was interested in something that was super practical. Uh-huh, yes. And... Um, and and that was what Stuart was trying to do. And, and, you know, that was the, to me, I mean, this is the thing that surprised me about, the, the thing that I think I learned from a, uh, one of the journals that was not originally in the collection of his journals that I read, but he gave me later. And, and that was, you know, most people now think of, uh, well, there have been, there's this, there are these arguments that somehow brand uh, and the whole earth catalog and his view of the world led directly to the modern S- Silicon Valley view. Mm. And what I came to see while I was working on the book is, is I believe it's exactly the opposite huh. that brand uh, is in fact an expression of the forces that were forging Silicon Valley in the 1960s. And that view of the world spread out through that, um, uh, through that, through that catalog to an entire generation, including people like your yeah. father. And it was an early impact of the forces that were creating Silicon That's Valley. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, optimism, uh, optimism about technology was prior to digital technology, yeah. but, you know, tools are valuable things to, um, to, you know, amplify the thing, the things that you want to do. In yeah. them. And it was like this instruction manual for inventing your life that tapped into an entire generation. You know, some of them went back to the land like your dad, but other people were like people like Steve Jobs, mm-hmm. and it was simply a fantasy amplifier right. for them. <laughs> fantasy amplifier, I think, is yeah, it's like an infrastructure of fantasy or something like that. You know, it's a, uh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how does you know, as we kind of like briefly mentioned, Brand is very involved in psychedelic culture and the kind of the, what we think of as sixties and seventies. Hey, he's hanging out with Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters and all this kind of stuff. So how does that his in your understanding, how does his taking part in that kind of culture feed into him becoming editor of the Whole Earth Catalog? Like, how does that transition make sense? Well, let's see. I mean, the catalog happened. I mean, his his inspiration that this would be useful to his friend happened just as he was walking away from the drug culture. He was, you know, the amazing thing about Brand is he was early to many things, and oftentimes he was leaving just when the rest of us mm-hmm. showed up, which is absolutely true in my case when you talk about psychedelics um so the the path into psychedelics and the role that psychedelics played on the peninsula during the 50s late 50s and 60s is the heart of a lot of stuff that is entangled uh, around these modern technologies and brand was in the midst of it so you go, you have to go back to this very interesting I think he's one of the most interesting folk characters in American cultural history, a man by the name of Al Hubbard, um, who uh, grew up in the Seattle area. He had a murky past that was involved in uh, uh, rum running and uh, the OSS uh, smuggling uh, uranium into the United States and running guns into Europe. Um, he invented an anti-gravity device in the 1920s. Oh no, it wasn't anti-gravity device. It was a you know free uh-huh. energy device in the 19 in the 1920s. Just a strange, strange character. He stumbled across LSD in Europe in the 1950s, and he in effect became the Johnny Appleseed of LSD along the West Coast. Uh, and he was the person who introduced Aldous Huxley to LSD in Los Angeles, for example. Um, Gerald Hurd heard to LSD, other, another interesting writer. Um, in that early pre-psychedelic uh, community. So he comes through the Bay Area and ends up um, uh, sort of stumbling across uh, this group of people who uh, are sort of a, 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 I wouldn't call it a religious cult, but it's, it's close mm-hmm. to a religious cult. And he introduces them to psychedelics. And a group of mostly technical people, uh, electrical engineers around Stanford, begin experimenting with th- these psychedelics in the late 50s, early 60s. In 1962, they set up an organization called the Inter- International Foundation for Advanced Study in Menlo Park, which is intended to prove that there's a relationship between LSD and creativity. 
and they offer ultimately between 350 and 500 people on the peninsula. This is now 62 to 66, a very intense experience in LSD. And then you're supposed to sort of engage in your uh -huh. creative design stuff. And they were sort of exploring this. One of the first people to go through this was Stuart. This is actually um, before he actually came in contact hmm. with Kesey. He had, you know, he'd, he had played with LSD, uh, with other psychedelics on the East Coast while he was in the military. Um, he comes back, he has this intense LSD experience. He meets Kesey. Um, and, you know, throughout the 60s, I mean, he, he becomes um, a peyote roadman because of his contact with the American Indians. Um, you know, he uses uh, LSD. He's involved in the acid tests, um, which, you know, Kesey basically was running uh, 63 to 64 to 60, 66. He organizes himself the most uh, uh, sort of the largest and the most uh, sort of ambitious acid test, which is called the Trips Festival at the Longshoremen's Hall in January of 1966. LSD is still a legal drug. Um, and that's an important cultural event because it was the first time, as Tom Wolf wrote, it was the first time the 10,000 hippies in the Bay Area realized that there were 10,000 <laughs> hippies and it had this idea of, of catalyzing yeah. a community. It led directly to the Summer of Love and the Haight-Ashbury and to the San Francisco music scene because they, because Stewart basically brought in Bill Graham to take tickets and, and help them with marketing. And Graham realized that there was money in music. And the, the day after the Trips Festival, he went out and leased the Fillmore. Um, that became yeah. the home base for the for the San Francisco music scene, and so Stewart would spend about uh, another two years, uh, you know, in that psychedelic world. And then in 1969, I mean, of course, Kesey yeah. moved away from from LSD, and Stewart was there at the acid test graduation. 69 was actually the last time he took LSD, and, and he he was done with yeah. it. He moved on, and you know, at the same time, he was showing Doug Engelbart's. Um, system which was called the online system to Kesey and they gave Kesey an hour-long demonstration of this writing tool basically and Kesey walked away shaking his head saying this is obviously the next thing after <laughs> LSD and it turned out that it was and Stuart then of course a couple years later wrote this seminal piece in Rolling Stone uh, on on space war um, uh, and it was really the first time that people like me, I read that from when I was in Eugene in graduate school, it was really the, it opened my eyes to the fact that what computers were going to be more accessible. And there were these things like uh -huh. computer networks. It was the first hint that we had that. And, and he, uh, he sort of, he framed that as the next step after, uh -huh. after drugs. So that was. And yeah. so how, I mean, there's computers are, are part of his vision and become even more part of his vision and, and his writing uh, in the 80s. We'll get to that. But how does he become so focused on tools and how does he, you know, how does he get into this kind of stuff that we associate with the back of the, to the land movement, but is much bigger than that, obviously. Yeah. yeah so, you know, when Stuart was on, he was living in San Francisco. Um, he was, uh, able to attend a series of lectures that Buckminster Fuller gave at, uh, at, uh, in San Jose and was, was really affected by still, uh, uh, Fuller's view of the world in, in that period, uh, 66. Um, and, and so Fuller, of course, is the one. And if you ask Stuart, where does this access to tools idea come from? You'll, he'll, say, he'll say he was simply channeling Buckminster mm. Fuller. Fuller's argument was, if you want to change the world, you give someone a tool and teach them how to use this. And I guess this is a notion that must go all the way back to mm -hmm. Archimedes, right? Um, give me a lever and I'll move the world. But Fuller uh, sort of drove it home to Brand. And that was the framing he brought to, you know, he was going to make tools accessible to, to his friends. Now, but what I, what I realized from finding this lost journal that he kept in the year before he started the catalog, uh, you know, late 67 to 68, is he was also more influenced by Douglas Engelbart than he uh -huh. remembers. And if you think about what Engelbart was doing, he was working on designing computing as the universal tool. That was what was emerging. Yeah. It's this digital tool that would, would you know, transform all media ultimately. And Stuart understood that intuitively. And uh, you know, he, he captured that. And so it was from those two, you know, Engelbart and, and, um, and Fuller uh, were very influential in, in, in that period. For yeah, I mean, that was something that really stood out to me about your book and that uh, was new to me is I, you know, 
he's kind of famously involved with the whole earth electronic link this famous early online community and you know and then he writes the his 1987 book the media lab inventing the future at mit and i always thought that saw that as kind of a shift in his focus but i feel like you're saying it's more he's already kind of thinking about those issues in this earlier period so then how do you think about what he's up to in the 80s then i mean is it just like an increasing focus or well so the 80s i mean so is it there is this period in the 70s that we should talk about first. You know, he, he walks away from the catalog. He sets it down. His life is falling apart. His marriage dissolves. Um, and he gives up on it. And he famously, I mean, I describe this thing in the book where he becomes suicidal because the, the catalog is just yeah. overwhelming him. I mean, he's had issues with depression throughout his life. His marriage is falling apart. He's out in the front yard of the place where he's living. This is 19... 69 now, 1970, right after he started, he'd already having a lot of trouble. He decided he was ending the catalog one year mm -hmm. after he started it. Uh, and it only lasted for three years in the first iteration. He's out in the front yard and he's digging a coffin shaped hole in the front yard a little bit deeper every day. And the woman who's, li you know, who rents him this space says, Stuart, what are you doing? And Stuart says, well, you know, I, I, I went to God and I said, you know, what's my next big big idea. What's, what's next, God? And God said, sorry, Stuart, that was it. <laughs> so he's got this very yeah. dark view of, and ultimately he restarts the catalog uh, in 1974 as the Coevolution Quarterly. He decides he's going to create this kind of um, New Yorker of Sausalito, mm -hmm. if you will, this interesting magazine where he'll be the mad monk at the center of it, and he'll then do catalogs again. And so your dad found one of those catalogs in yeah. the mid-1970s that that was a part of the restart of the catalog. And so he goes through this period. Now, during this period, in terms of his ideas um, and what's motivating him, he had fallen under the spell of Gregory Bateson. And so he really went from the engineering, mechanistic systems view of Fuller to this much more organic, biological mm -hmm. view of the world that goes back to, I mean, he, he, you know, he was a biology student at Stanford. He'd been very influenced by Ehrlich. He'd seen these ideas around coevolution, and he takes that to heart. And that really becomes his frame, his, the prism through which he views the world through the 70s. The other thing that happens that people don't really realize is, you know, Holder's catalog, he really had yeah. a libertarian view of the world, not so much an economic one, right. but an individualist view of, you know, we'll take care of it ourselves and we'll do our own thing kind of view, very kind of hippie view. But in 1976, 77, he spends time in the first uh, Jerry Brown administration. And he comes out of that with a, with a respect hmm. for good government, for the value of government. And so, you know, by the mid 70s, late 70s, he's no longer a libertarian in, in that sense of the world. He's, he's moved pretty much into whatever kind of liberalism G yeah. Jerry Brown represents. And that sticks with him. So here we come into the 80s. And, you know, people now give him great credit for yeah. the well and think of the well from historical viewpoint as being early. The well was late. The digital culture was already emerging, and it was not, uh, it was not uh, uh, hmm. geographically centered. I mean, if I had to sort of look for the roots for a digital culture in America, I would point to CompuServe, Source, yeah, yeah. Prodigy. And most importantly, if you want to look at a digital libertarian culture, it was coming hmm. out of Usenet, um, which was this distributed network of Unix computer centers all over the world that had this libertarian kind of vibe to it. So that was all happening. The well happened at the same time. You know, 85, which was, you know, there'd been a half a decade mm -hmm. of computer networking already going on. But Stuart, um, you know, he had, he, he, uh, he, had, uh, he had spent time with the bulletin board systems and uh, with an eyes conferencing system because of a teaching job he had in Southern California. So he knew about that. Larry Brilliant, who was this doctor who had been in India, had started up this, uh, this uh, system, uh, developed his own system and persuaded Stuart. He wanted Stuart to restart the Polith catalog as an electronic version. Stuart wanted to create a conferencing system and he created the well. And you know what people don't know um, also is that really six years later, so 85 to 91, Stuart decided the mm -hmm. well was a failure because he ran smack into all of the uh, the virtual community yeah. problems that we're <laughs> yeah. now grappling with as a world. He was early to it. He remains a technolo technological optimist, and so he didn't call it out, mm. his own experience. But his own experience led him to walk away from the well and 
feeling he'd failed to create the kind of convivial community that he mm-hmm. wanted to create. Yeah, I saw that as a theme throughout the book, too. I mean, he he had a tendency to create these things that others saw are great. They're getting very involved, and eventually he would kind of walk away from them. You know, he had kind of done this several times yeah. throughout his career. Oh, well, he did it. I mean, that's the that's the, the standard operating principle yeah. of Brand's life, is that he's great at starting things. Um, you know, what, what do you do? Um, someone asked him, what, who are you? What are you up to? He says, well, I find things, and I found <laughs> things. And he's... He's very proud of the of being able to create institutions that right. persist, um, and and in some cases he has, and he's thinking hard about that with this organization right. called Along Now Now, which he's trying to get to the point where it will last longer than the group. Yeah, I was actually going to turn to the Along Now Next. I mean, I think within my community, uh, at least, he's this is something he's pretty well known for um, is the Long Now Foundation, and it's you know which is most famous for its like clock of the long now, this clock that's supposed to um, last like 10,000 years. And the foundation itself is meant to shift us from short-term thinking to long-term thinking. So how do you feel, how do you feel like this, this starts up in the 90s, right? And then the mid-90s. And so how do, you, how do you see this as kind of like fitting in his overall story, this kind of development? Yeah, so... Um... When Danny Hillis, who a, was a supercomputer scientist who created a company called Thinking Machines, began to sort of obsess about the fact that we were in thinking increasingly short term during the 1990s, he sent out a letter to about 30 of his friends, and he took some reporters on walks to, uh, to, to uh, pass this idea along to him. I was completely confused by it, which uh, was unfortunate. I think it's an interesting idea. Um, he sent out this email, and Stuart was the only huh. person who wrote back and said, well, you know, if you're doing this clock, you need to create a library. Um, Stuart was was thinking then about libraries and continuity and um, basically basically the maintenance of society over generations. Mm-hmm. Um, he'd already started to think along. Uh, long-term thinking was on his mind at that point. And so it fit very nicely. Um, it became his overriding passion. I mean, it's you know, he's been engaged in that since 1995. Um, he spun an organization out of it with his wife, Ryan Phelan, in 2011 called Revive mm-hmm. and Restore, which is committed to this, some of the same principles. And, um, you know, he's working now. It's, you know, even though he thought he didn't have enough energy for a book, about three years ago, he started to work on a book on the importance right. of maintenance for uh, survival of civilization. And I guess the, you know, if you want to, what's the, how do you explain that? The, the, the best example they cite uh, uh, for this long term, the importance of the value of long term thinking is this this anecdote about uh, uh, Oxford University, where uh, they discovered that one of the main buildings in the school, the roof had worn out, and they were trying to figure out where are they going to get the timber they yeah. need to replace this. And so they asked the forester, and for the Oxford had a forester, and said, "Oh, you know, sir, I wondered when you were going to ask us. We started growing this forest six hundred <laughs> years ago, so somebody mm-hmm. had the foresight to actually plant these trees and." To keep keep them uh, for that period of time. And I, I think that's a very mm-hmm. nice framing. So uh, you brought up his like kind of transition away from libertarianism uh, a couple minutes ago, and and also I think it connects. What I want to ask you also connects to what you called his technological optimism. So you mentioned at least twice in the book that Brand's always been kind of attracted to power, or he's kind of been around power, and this comes like you know people he's associated with universities connected to we can just kind of keep going down the uh list but it's got me thinking about something in the, in the technology study circles i run in i think brand has a very mixed reputation and a lot of people criticize him for basically being what we might call like apolitical in some sense and the critic criticism goes that you know he's well known he has a big megaphone lots of twitter followers for instance but he doesn't use that for what you know, certain people would say like is their vision of social good. So, like, give a concrete example. He's not publicly cr- criticizing Amazon for its lousy labor practices. He's like taking money from Bezos to to build the clock. You know, it would be like a classic example that folks would point to of like he's not really going after the power structures that kind of create ill stuff, at least directly and publicly and vocally. So, how do you, what do you kind of make of that criticism and uh, you know yeah. what it the role it plays in his life. Yeah, so um, Stuart is someone who, when we spoke first about his politics, um, he self-identified as uh-huh. conservative. But 
it's a he's a conservative who can't read the Wall Street Journal because he's so hmm. infuriated by their editorial. So what kind of conservative is that? And we went back and forth a lot about what his politics were. I think his politics with respect to sort of activism have also cycled back and forth. I mean, he was active on environmental yeah. issues at some point. However, at the same time, when he started the whole earth catalog in the context of the of a really intense anti-war movement, he decreed that there would be no politics right. in there. there. You know, there would be no religion, no politics, no art in the original whole earth catalog. And in fact, he violated his principles yeah. constantly in there. I mean, you know, uh, Gary Snyder uh, published his, his uh, four principles in, in uh, a whole earth supplement. Um, so it, there was a little bit of contradiction in there. He had early on a confrontation or a, basically he ended up working with some people who he, who called yeah. themselves new leftists. In fact, although they were actually Maoist, I was part of the new left and I was not part of the uh, the Maoist or the Marxist yeah. part of the new left. Um, and so uh, I, I had a different perspective than Stuart, but it, it, he was really traumatized yeah. by his... Uh, his early interactions with the, the what he called the new left. He was also on he was also on basically in Kesey's orbit and what he called the psychedelic side of the uh -huh. anti-war movement, which was sort of anti-political in as yeah. much as you can call it that way. And so, um, you know, he he's shied away from activism at times. He's been an activist at other times. He's been a local activist mm. on on uh, community issues in Sausalito, for example. Yeah, so it's mixed. And in fact. I just I find he's closest to Jerry Brown on in so many so many ways. Um, you know his heart on lots of these issues um, is mm -hmm. on the left. I mean I think that and and his head might yeah. be on the right. You know and so he's torn. I think is the reason that it gets. Can so you characterize like how you've come to think of his conservatism I and mean, what do you, what do you think that means to him when he says I'm conservative? Well, I I think it's strongest. Yeah, it's it it it. Andy Kirk, Andrew Kirk, the environmental historian, talks about this thread, uh, this conservative thread within the American environmental uh -huh. movement. I think that sort of is where uh, this goes back yeah. to Teddy Roosevelt. That's sort of the conservationism. Line that, you know, you have to align. Right? Yeah. Yes. Cons as much as conver yes, very much so. He now does not call himself an environmentalist. He calls himself a conservationist, right. and it, he feels that the environmental movement. Uh, or large strands of the environmental movement that he helped create um, has actually, you know, got this kind of Luddite framing of simply being anti-technological, right. um, where he feels that we're, for better or ill, we're 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 bound to technology. It it, it you can't separate humanity from yeah. from you know the use of yeah, tools. Yeah. And I I. I I think I came around. I mean, I've always been more nuanced right. on technology than I think Stuart is. I've been willing to criticize technologies, but um, I can be optimistic about technologies too. So I, I you know, I, I think there's a, a, a bit of a contradiction, but I also see his perspective. Um, and I think you can kind of square, square the circle. I, I mean, what I find most refreshing about Brand is his willing to reassess hmm. his position. And you know he he's moved back and he's, he doesn't stay locked in things. He he can be moved mm -hmm. by evidence. I mean the stuff on, uh, you know the, the stuff on nuclear power is interesting because the environmental movement I think is more torn about nuclear power oh, yeah. than they were. Uh, a or geoengineering. The nature of the or argument, geoengineering, which he also yes, advocates for. So this yeah. is I was going to ask you about right. this. You know his book Whole Earth Discipline and Eco Pragmatist Manifesto, which is very controversial in some environmental circles. Because he pushes for nuclear power right. and 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 geo, but go on. I want I want you to if well. So I was just thinking about the nuclear yeah. power in, uh, issue first, because um, I've found that the framing on nuclear power from the environmental perspective has now yeah. changed. The original debate was over right. waste, and now the criticism, which I think might be value, is that nuclear is too late. It can't right. help us. <laughs> it won't come quickly yes. enough because of the cow and. And so it's a very different framing of of the issue, but um, you know, Brand, uh, you know, he he got um, he was mildly anti nuclear during the seventies and into the eighties. Then Peter Schwartz mm. convinced him that um, the waste issue was not uh, correctly framed by the environmentalist, and it was necessary to get across yeah. the chasm on in terms of two sustainable uh, uh, energy sources. And you know. I'm I'm watching that debate. Yeah. I, I he opened me up a little bit on it. I was sort of 
completely anti-nuclear. And now I think, well, if these next generation yeah. nuclear technologies work, right. we need them. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually, I don't have strong, some of my friends have strong views on nuclear and, and geo, but I don't, you know. My, my thing is more the regulatory side of it. You know, I feel like so many of the issues are on climate change and stuff. There's clearly corporate interests that are keeping them the way there is, and the only way you get through that is politics. And that's just like not, that's not how he yeah. tends to frame the discussion, you know, is in terms of like, the civil rights type stuff, you know, to go back to your earlier story that we would might need to uh, to get from here to there, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I, I, I agree. And so I, what I like, I mean, for me, I was, you know, I'm, I'm a text. Well, as a kid, I was I, I've moved away from my left wing <laughs> politics, but I was a textbook yeah. new leftist and bumping into Stuart was good for me because, you know, I would see. I would see as a result of talking to him, I'd see the world yeah. in different ways, and I'd go, "Whoa, well, you know, I get it breaks you out of your paradigm. That can be very." You know, valuable. I forgot to ask you earlier, just to get a you know, so listeners here, what do you remember the first time you met him? When when you were first like, so when <laughs> when were you because like you guys inhabited like no, similar worlds for a long time. So like, when was the first time you were around? Yeah, him? I have I have two. <laughs> I mean. The first time I actually met him was the 1984 Hackers Conference, but there are two earlier uh, uh, collisions with him. Um, one was uh, we both shared the same event when I was growing up and he was at Stanford. A De Gaulle, a De Gaulle, Charles De Gaulle came to Silicon Valley, well, before Silicon Valley, he came to Stanford Industrial Park in 1960 and got this tour. And as he was leaving town, he went down uh, the he, his motorcade went down Waverly, which went right past my house. And so all the school kids were let out of let out of school, and we were all standing there waving our flags or whatever when de Gaulle came through and you know his nose, his cap, it was really quite iconic. And I remember it most clearly because the kids across the street who were a little older, one of them dressed up as Napoleon uh, and <laughs> lay in the gutter. To... <laughs> and then I found in, in, I found in Stewart's journal that he was driving out uh, to do research for his senior thesis on that same day and the, co and the motorcade uh, passed him as well. That was, that was the first almost intersection. And then the, the even funnier one is when I was sort of a, a young reporter and went to work for, Inter, for InfoWorld and began my coverage of the personal computer industry, I was in, I was in Las Vegas covering a Comdex and I was invited to the um, Epson printer uh -huh. party in a hotel on the Strip. And I was, you know, I'd been a starving journalist and here I was in this opulent environment and I was standing one evening in front of the largest bowl of cooked shrimp <laughs> I'd ever seen in my life. And I looked up and on the other side of the bowl of shrimp was Stuart Brand. And so I said, oh, I get it. Because I knew we both come out of this sort of yeah. counterculture and we were both being dragged into this. Main and so there was some irony that I saw, <laughs> saw in that. And that's what was happening is that, you know, and Stuart at that point was starting one of his biggest failures. This is 1982. And he was starting the Holder mm. software catalog turned out to be just this terrible yeah. idea for a variety. Yeah. So then I met him. I, I met him two years later at the, at the hacker. Cool, man. So I, you know, have, have you talked too much about the maintenance book? I'm, you know, that's one I, I write about maintenance too. I have a book about maintenance. And uh, ah. so he actually, yeah. Oh, and I, 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 I founded this group <laughs> called the maintainers and we hold conferences and he came to maintainers three. So, uh, yeah, and so oh, cool. I'm, I met him in person, oh, and you know, he was a, he was a fun guy to chat with, for real. Yeah. Oh no, what was your, what's your book on? What was your book on? Uh, it's called the Innovation I Delusion. So the argument of the the book okay. is that you know our fetishization of the new and uh, uh, shiny often leads us to kind of neglect what we have, uh, uh, what we already have. And I think Stuart yeah. likes the second part of the argument. He doesn't like the first part of the argument, which involves beating <laughs> up on like Silicon Valley and stuff like this, you know, is not his cup of tea. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's, that's interesting. We, we talked, I mean, we talked about it in general terms. I, so I drove a stake in the ground. I was trying to figure out how do I end a book about a guy who's still yeah, active sure. and thriving in the world. And so I sort of decided to end in 2010, 2011, um, after the after the launch of the clock and and before revive mm -hmm. and restore because my attempt to separate biography from journalism yeah basically and so so yeah, still doing it yeah yeah the, and so i didn't talk i didn't uh he was just getting started on the maintenance book when, when we were finishing right? yeah 
His short chapter that came out as a little like Amazon thing is really fun and people should yeah. check it out. It's like about the World yeah. Cup and how they have to like, you know, constantly transform the ships uh, as they maintain them as yeah. they're going along. So it's, it's what we've seen so far is already good, I think. Yeah. And what's up? What's up next for you? Do you have a do you have a next project? Are you? Oh, what are you going to do? Well, I have two different directions or three different directions. I'm struggling with them. I'm, I'm kind of uh -huh. neurotic about it. I, I, I'm thinking about um, a biography of Engelbart, although I don't mm -hmm. know if I'll do it. There is a biography of Engelbart, but it's, it's more of an yeah. academic, uh, and there needs to be a journalistic uh, account of, I just don't know if I have the energy to spend a couple more years yes, in the Stanford I know collection. What you mean. And, and then I'm also, this is entirely different. I was part of, before I, you know, while I was, before I became a professional, journalist. I was part of something that I think of part of the new left called the power structure research huh. movement. Um, that's totally lost in history. And there, there were about a dozen groups around the country that, that uh, were sort of engaged in speaking truth to power. And sort of that we thought at that point that if we simply exposed these anti-democratic yeah. power relations, it would have an infect, a, a impact on policy. <laughs> what year <laughs> so, was this? We, we were naive. So this, the, this is from the mid sixties. Okay. Uh, well, it was it was okay. the '60s basically, the, and and so there were these groups like um, uh, the North American Congress on Latin okay. America, National Action Research Against the Military Industrial Compl uh, hmm. Complex, Pacific Northwest Research Center. I was going to say groups, it sounds like Nader's um, Raiders Pacific kind study, of stuff. Yeah, very much Nader's stuff. Pacific Study Center. There was a guy by the name of G. William Dumhoff. Oh yeah, who wrote I, I have America, that book. Who was a, yeah. <laughs> who, <laughs> well, so he was a disciple yeah. of C. Wright Mills, um, and Mills sort okay. of is where this this started. So between the muckraker, we were the inheritors of the the muckrakers and C. Wright Mills view. Yeah, of, of that sounds cool, America. man. I, I would love to know that story. I thought I would do some some yeah. oral histories and try to collect that, and I've been talking to people. Um, so yeah. that might be a, that's entirely different, and I I I think I don't think there's a book there, but there might be a good uh -huh. essay, uh, you know, about the, the from the oral history. Did you say there was a third thing, or those the two kind of things you're chewing on? It. Oh, the third thing is is um, you know, I have a slightly open door yeah. at the New York Times. I still re I freelance for them on occasion, and I'm I'm interested in some of the technologies around. Uh, that are you know material science, yeah. quantum computing. You've written about uh, nanotech for a long time, power. right? I mean, so that was a, like a thread. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. So I mean, just yeah, that's yeah, yeah, fun. fascinating and, stuff, yeah. right? And I, yeah, and some of it's going to have. I mean, you know, fusion power if it works big is deal. a big deal. Yeah. Um, quantum computing if right. it works is a big deal. <laughs> you could call and, it you know, if it works. Uh, and I'm <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a good idea. I like that. <laughs> yeah, if it works. That is actually yeah, kind of steal that from you. Have it. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you some other examples too, I think. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we we've been around yeah. long enough to, to uh to have a slightly yeah. raised eyebrow. About well, John, man, this was so much fun. It was wonderful talking to you about your career, and thanks so much for taking the time today. Yeah, very good to meet you, and um, I hope we can stay in touch. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are supported by the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Fort is the Athenaeum Coordinator and Digital Humanities Specialist at VT Libraries, and he serves as producer and sound engineer for the podcast. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs>